Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, we're talking about journey into prayer. Uh, we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, and tonight we're going to talk about knowing God as Father. The prayers that just went forth was very powerful prayers, and what God is doing in our lives, we, we need to understand that prayer is a journey. And when I was growing up, one of the things we always did was have a prayer journal on what we did. So I, as I speak tonight, and, and I know evangelists just pray, but, but I, I want to pray again. Father, we ask you tonight, Father, that as your word goes forth, Father, we speak that those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit of God is saying to them tonight. Let them hear what you are saying to them, O oh God. Father, I decrease that you may increase in their lives. I speak, Father, that it be all in you and none of me. Think through me, move through me, speak through me, do what you will do. Father, tonight we know the Spirit is already stirring, the prayers have already gone forth. And Father, tonight as the word goes forth, let those that have ears, let them hear what you're saying. Let them be edified. Let them hear something from you tonight that will let them know that you are there, you are listening to them, and you are there in the midst of them. We speak now, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, my name is Minister Anthony Hart, and uh, it's a pleasure to be before you tonight to minister the Word of God. We are in our uh, journey into prayer. Uh, last couple of weeks, we've been talking different vari variations of prayer. Tonight, we're going to we're going to talk through, through the aspect of knowing God as Father. So, as we as we're going into our journey of prayer, we we want to pray from an aspect of of our position that we know God as our Father. Now, uh, fatherhood was talked about in the Old Testament. In um, Exodus, you can see it. In Deuteronomy, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, you can all see aspects of um, God as our Father. But in most of the time, when, in the Old Testament, God said that I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell among you. So He spoke as a as a God, as a as a person, as of God more so than as a father. But if you look at some of these scriptures, he talks about it from the aspect of at least qualities of what a father is to his children. In Exodus, he talks about, I'm a, I'm, I'm a father to my sons, and I will get them out of Egypt. So you see through these scriptures that he talks about, so in Exodus, especially in Deuteronomy, because in Deuteronomy, he talks about what, how they came out of the land of Egypt and how he brought them out of Egypt. And, and as Moses was speaking, you see the whole, through the whole uh, thing of Deuteronomy, you see him as God, as, as someone that is providing for his people, is bringing them out. In Isaiah and in Jeremiah, you see it as in Malachi. So you can go through those scriptures and, and look at those. And, um, but I want to quote one, Hosea 11, 1 through 4, and this kind of gives us some qual qualities of God. Isaiah, Hosea 11, 1 through 4. It says, when Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more the prophets called them, the more they went from the prophets. They kept sacrificing to the bells and burning incense to the idols. Yet I, yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of a man with bonds of love. And I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws, and I bent down and fed them. Now that sounds like a parent to me. He wants to feed. He wants to feed his children. He wants to um, lead them and guide them. He wants to teach them how to, how to do certain things. So even though it may not come out and say as father, in certain scriptures there, they 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 kind of, he did kind of play that role as as a father figure to to the children of Israel. Now, it's interesting. As we move into the New Testament, one of the first things that, um, that people said, the disciples told Jesus was, teach us to pray. In Matthew 6, 11, Matthew 6, um, verses 9 to 11, it talks about teach us to pray. In Luke 11, 1 through 4, it says teach us to pray. The interesting th thing was the Jews read the Torah, they read the Torah four times a week. They, they pray three times a day. However, in the Old Testament, the fatherhood of God appears to be a minor doctrine. So when Jesus comes upon the scene 
and, and he's talking about father, father, father. They're like, wait a minute, this is, this is something different. We know him as, we've known him as Jehovah Jireh. We've known him as Jehovah Rapha. We've known him as a healer. We've known him as a sanctifier, a redeemer. But now you're, you're speaking on a level that's more intimate here. You're speaking, Jesus, you're speaking on, a more, on an intimate level. They're speaking with one of authority. So as you're speaking, Jesus, teach us to pray like that because we want to be able to commune with him as our father as well. We want to be able to speak to him as a father. So in the New Testament, knowing God as a father is, is, part, is a major doctrine. In the Gospel of John alone, Jesus referenced God as the father or my father 107 times. He refers to himself as the son of God or simply the son in context with the father approximate 30 times. So the disciples, they're listening to this. They're hearing him, Jesus calls them out, especially in Matthew, because in Matthew, he's doing the what traditionally is known as the, the Sermon on the Mount. This is where he's going and teaching things to, to the people that some of the uh, doctrines that they have was like, okay, this is, I need to clarify this. This mean, You say this, but this is what this means. You say this, but this is what we really mean by that. So he was going through this thing and teaching them. So part of that was in that they said, teach us to pray, because what you're saying to us we, we have learned this is our traditions. We, we know how to come and, and, and thank God for what he did in, in Egypt. We know from the Exodus what he did, and we know we, every Friday night from 6 p.m. to uh, Saturday at 6 p.m., we read the scriptures. We read, so we know that we're to pray. They, we, they knew to pray, but their effectual part of the prayer was like, wait a minute, this is different. What, what you're showing us now is, is totally different from what we've learned. And these disciples, remember, they were, the, they, were part, they were part of the Jews. So as we look at things, as we look at this, there are five things that we must understand about getting to know God as Father as we pray. We want to, as we know God as Father, as Jesus connected with God as Father. He connected him as, you are my Father, I am your Son, Father in heaven, hallowed be our name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, 107 times in John alone. So throughout the four Gospels, J Jesus consistently referenced him as Father. And he says, you know what? He can be your Father too. He is your Father as well. Um, now, so five things we understand about God to know God is his Father. The first one, he's a Father who loves. So John 17, 20 through 26 says, I did not pray for these alone. Now, this, now hear me, this is when John, this is John's prayer. We understand Matthew 6 and, and, and Luke where he teaches them to pray, but here is actually a, a glimpse into Jesus actually praying to the Father. He's actually speaking to Father. He's actually praying to Father. So this is recorded in the scriptures. He says, I did not pray for these alone in verse 20. He says, I do not pray for John chapter 17. I did not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that, the, that they may behold my glory, which you gave me, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now we're hearing here that Jesus says, God, you're, you're not just God, you're a father. And you're not, just a, you're not just one who wants to correct, but, but you're one who loves. You have, a, you have a love, and your love, through your love, you sent me, and now I have these disciples. And, and Father, my desire is that they be one just like we are one. Just let them see how me and you are one, and let them be that in us, because I know eventually what my purpose is. I, I know what my purpose is. So, Father, while I'm here on the earth, and, and I'm around these men. Let, let this thing be in them. This is what he's praying. This is what he's praying. And, and when they say, teach us to pray, and when you, we, we see how Jesus prays, we see that 
he teaches us that God is a loving father. Now, some of us might, may not be able to um, relate to this. Some of us may, you know, with our father's different things, some of us might not even know who our father was. So for some of us to call God father could have been a struggle at times. But as you, as you get into the word of God and as you let the word get into you and as you become one with God and you're able to call him Abba, Father, things begin to change. Things begin to break because your level of authority, your level of how you communicate with the Father, it's not like he's up there and you're down here. It's like, Father, we are one. Father, we are one. So when we're speaking and we're making our requests known before him, we're speaking to him as not somebody that's far away, but we're speaking to him that's right here. He's listening to every word we have to say, just like Jesus knew everything Jesus said. He said he knew because he had been with God from the beginning. He knew who he was. Now, in Romans 8, 15, uh, 8, Romans 8, 15 through 17, and then in 37, 39, we, we hear more about the, the love. For you, Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created things shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now may I add coronavirus. Persuaded that, that, that coronavirus will not keep us from the love of God, coronavirus, COVID-19, what's going on in America, what's going on in the different parts of the world is not going to keep us from the love of God. We have to know, first of all, whose we are. We're his, we're in God. He is our father. And we have to know, we have to know what he is. He says that there's nothing, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come shall be able to separate us from the love of God. God will move mountains at your request when, it's, when, you, when you're connecting with him, when you're connecting with him in prayer. And, and, and you're like, you're my father. And God knows what's going on. We, he knows what's going on in the midst. He knows what's happening. He knows with us. And you have to trust that he loves you. You have to trust that he is a God of love. He is not a man that she, he should lie or son of man that he should have to repent. So some of us who may have had fathers in different areas, God says, that's not who I am. I am not a man that I should lie or son of man that I should repent, but I am your father. And when you call up on me, I am there and I will answer you. And as we walk through this journey of prayer, we walk through this to answer these powerful prayers. When we pray, we have to know that he is our father and he's listening to us. Just like when, when a, a child cries out, they, they, they realize somebody's going to come and either feed them, change them, do something to teach them to walk. And it's the same way. Now, when we were a child, we spoke like a child, but now as we are adults, we're adults. Teenagers, you're still, you're still growing up. But as we mature in Christ and we mature in God, we understand another level of fatherhood. Now, I understand, and I'm not there because my sons are still teenagers, but I understand as, as children move out of the parents' house, sometimes their relationship even grows stronger because they still have that healthy relationship as father and children. Fa the, the daughters, their daughters still come and celebrate Father's Day. They still come and celebrate the things that that's going on in their lives. So we, we have to understand the level of where we are from the point that he is our father and he, he loves us. So first we have to understand that he loves us. Bear with me. I've got a kind of a new setup here, so I'm learning and I have to use so much paper. Now secondly, he's a father who comforts. A father who comforts. Second Corinthians 1, 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which 
We ourselves are comforted by God, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, we understand that some, some of the things that he comforts us with is through his promises. In the word of God, I remember growing up, and I remember hearing Kenneth Hagin, he was talking about, in order to know who you are, you have to search the scriptures. One of the things he talks about is he talked about his promises, and some, someone has noted there's like over 7,000 promises in, in God's word. Now, I don't know who actually counted each promise, but there, there is, it's been said that there's over 7,000 promises in the word of God, and God has never broken that one promise. Now, some of the things we can understand as we go through the scriptures in the New Testament is look at the ones that says, in him, in whom, by whom, through whom, in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, with Christ. These are his promises. He promises to never leave us nor forsake us. He promises that we are the head and not the He promises that these things shall go well. With you. He promises, a, beloved, I pray above all things that thou prosper, even as thy soul prospers. These things, he says, in Christ, you are more than conquerors in Christ. So as we're going through this coronavirus, we hold on to the scripture that says, God, you said that we are more than conquerors. This coronavirus will not conquer us. We know that a lot of things has happened and a lot of things has gone on. But, Father, we are believing what your word says. We are putting you to your word. You are our Father, and you said that we are more than conquerors. You said that, that the things that we have, you said, call upon you, and I will be near. Call upon me, and I will answer you. In tough times and trials, call, call upon my name, and I am there in the midst of you. So we know that he comforts us through his promises, through the word of God. Now, another way he, pro he, um, he comforts us is through his presence. We notice this in, in worship. We notice this in times when, when we get into worship, when we get into a, we go from praise to worship. Now, remember, this, it's all communication with God, so it's still a form of communication with God, a, a form of prayer. So as we worship him, as we're getting into his presence, he, he's comforting us. And I, I remember I was working on a project, and I was needing, gui I was needing guidance on it. And I was, I was just talking, talking to God, talking to him. I was like, Father, what, what do I need to do? And he took me to a song that was in the South African language, hear me, it wasn't in English. The song that he led me to was not in English. I didn't know the words to the song whatsoever. But the Spirit of God came into the room and flooded my room. There was such an awe, such a presence of God. And I knew at that time that what God was doing with this project was, was gonna be marvelous. He revealed to me what the, what the song was in English. He revealed to me the words. Now, the title is Gangi, Gangingazi, which means I didn't know or I never knew. The song is about hope and calling on him. It's a very, very anointed song. Um, Benjamin Dubé. And um, it is, if you can look it up on YouTube, it's called I Didn't Know or Gangingazi, which is... N-G-A-N-G-I-N-G-A-Z-I. -I. Google it on YouTube. This song, is a, <laughs> this song is about hope and calling on him. Now, my project that I'm, in, that I'm entering in and, and launching out is centered around hope. Now, I didn't know the language. <laughs> you, you've got to hear what I'm telling you when his, pres his presence knows no boundaries. He spoke to me through a song that I didn't, couldn't even understand the words. But then he was such a loving father. He shared the words to me to the song. He ministered to me spirit to spirit. Then he revealed to me through that song that the project that I'm working on, that song was all about that project. That's the father that we serve. And he's not, he's not a respected person. If he do it for me, he'll do it for you. When you look at these things, when you see this, when you understand that he's a God that comforts, he is a God that comforts. He comforts us through his presence. We've been in powerful, powerful uh, worship songs, even, even here, even tonight when um, Evangelist w was praying. The, the presence of God was strong. You could feel I was almost in tears because I was like, wow, the people, people are really going through these things. And as she was praying in the spirit, 
God was comforting someone out there. I know what I know, that God was comforting someone out there, that he was letting you know that, that I am here, and I'm doing what you call, what you want me to do. You're, I'm doing this. I'm here. And what it is, I'm there. I'm there. I'm right there. Because I'm a God who's going to comfort you. I remember, and I was thinking about this today, at our Mountain Movers Conference, and I believe it was either the Friday or Saturday night service, and we were, the shofar had blown, and then we got into a level of worship, and then everybody just got on their knees. And as we were on our knees just worshiping God, a, a word of prophecy came from this side, and then things came from that side, and things came all over. There was such a comfort and a presence of God during that Mountain Movers Conference. There was such a presence of God that it was, he wanted to know, let you know that I'm comforting you, because we didn't know it at the time, but a couple months later, we were going to be on quarantine. A couple months later, we were going to be on this, but God was letting us know in advance, I have you in the palm of my hand, because I am your father. So as we worship, and we get into worship, and not ever, I can't sing, but I'll get into the songs, and I'll, I'll get into worship, and I feel the presence of God on me as my father, and he comforts me with everything that I do. Number three way that uh, we need to know God, that God shows us, he's a father who cares. He's a father who cares. First Peter 5, 7, says, in the Amplified Version, it says, casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him who cares for you and if, who cares for you and affectionately and cares about you watchfully. So he's, just, he's watching over you as, as he sees these things. Right? He knows in the midst that we're having to wear masks and, and people are getting anxious and people are like, I, I want to get out of the house and I want to do this. God says, but talk to me. Cast that thing on me. Cast your care. Cast that burden on me. Cast that thing for me. And once and for all, no longer. Don't worry about it. When you put it on me, and you, and it's easy to say that we who have children, we, you know, the, out there in the coronavirus, worrying about doing this and worrying about this, and people are worrying about their bills. Yes, worries come, but God says, cast them. Cast the cares on me. Cast the cares on me. You know, I, I had a friend of mine, and um, she taught this message one time, and she says, don't ever tell me, take care, because God always tells me to cast my care, so don't ever tell me to take care. Now, she may have been a little religious at the time or whatever, but she was practicing what she knew. Cast your cares on God. Don't take the care. Don't take it. Cast that thing on God. Whatever it is that you're burdened with, cast that thing on your Father, for He cares. He cares for you. And I'm going to tell you, I need to say this and I, I'm saying it as, as mindfully as I can, that he cares for you, that he gave his only begotten son, that you could be here where you are tonight. And it, things have cost people, cost, in, in the last few months, things have cost people, but do you know what it cost the father to be in the house where you are right now? Do you know what it cost him? Do you know what it cost him? Yes, we have lost things. Yes, we've been through this. And yes, we've done that. But do you know what it cost the Father to be with you? It cost the Son, Jesus, dying on the cross. It cost him his life so he could be with you. He cares about you. Nah. Jesus is on the cross and saying, God, or before he gets on the cross, he said, God, not my will, but yours be done because I know you love these people. I know these are your people that you care for. I know. So, God, I know I, I'm asking you to take the cup from me, but I, I know, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Now, G Jesus became, he became sin for us. He became the propitiation of sin, the atonement for sin for us. When he's on the cross, the only time he does not call him Father he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, Jesus became sin for us and Father. He had never been separated from Father at all. Jesus had never been separated from him. So it wasn't the part of necessarily dying on the cross because he knew that would be over soon. But the, he could not stand not being with the Father. That was a cost he bore 
for us. He, he held out his hand to Thomas and said, look at the scars in my hand. Look in my side. My stripes, by your stripes, my stripes, you are made whole. He cares enough for you that he died on the cross for you. He's there, and he's wanting you to know that it cost him. It cost him. It cost him his son. It cost him everything that he had, but he's never stopped loving you. And now Jesus and Father, are, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, those that he died for, those that he died and went to the grave and came back, rose again, went to the was glorified and now he's sitting at the right hand of the father telling father look at my children look at your children look god look god this is what they need and then he's telling holy spirit holy spirit go pray through them go pray they know they don't know what they asked pray through them holy spirit so he's even sent us the comforter god cares for us so deeply more than we could ever ever think or imagine that he cares for us number t number four we, we got, let me go. We have to know that he cares. Some, somebody's praying right now and say, God, I don't, I don't know that you care. First of all, you're saying God instead of Father. God, I, I, I don't know that you care. And God's Father says, read my word. Read my word. This blood is for you. I care for you this much. He held out his hands and he died for you. There's nothing he will not provide for you. Now, but also, remember, he's a father, so he knows what's best for us. So some things we ask for, he says, eh, not really right now, because you might not be able to handle it right now. So we need to be like, Father, not our will be done, but your will. What is it that you want to do through me right now? Because it seems like I'm walking around in a circle. It seems like I'm walking around, and, and I'm not really saying, but your word says, Father, that you care for me. Your word says that you do this. So I know that you care, Father. So I know that you care. I know because you sent your son. So, Father, I'm going to rest in you, and I'm going to sit here tonight in this home, and I'm expecting you with your presence to come in, and I want you to minister to me. God says, I hear you tonight. I hear what you're saying to me. And God says, I am your father, and I will wipe away your tears. I will wipe away this. This thing won't last forever, but there is a time and a season right now that God is setting, resetting the body of Christ. He's resetting us so that we can have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with him in our own homes. Yes, it's great to come and fellowship together, but God says, I want you by yourself right now. I want you so that when you come back, that you'll be ready to do what I called you to do. Number four, he's a father who corrects. Okay. He's a father who corrects. Hebrews 12, 6 and 7. For the Lord corrects and disciplines everyone whom he loves, and he punishes even scorches, scourges every son whom he accepts and welcomes to his heart and cherishes. You must submit to it and endure correction for discipline. God is dealing with you as with sons. For what, the, what son is there whom the father does not thus train and correct and discipline? Even with his disciples. Peter, James, and John were in the garden. He took them because Jesus knew that he was getting ready to be betrayed and getting ready to go to the cross and fulfill his purpose. He took Peter, James, and John to the circle. And he, kept, he was praying, and then one of the Gospels, it says that drops of blood were coming from his capillaries in his, in his brain. He was praying. He would go back, and he'd see Peter, James, and John sleeping. And he said, can you not watch? Can you not be awake for an hour? Can you not watch for one hour? So he corrected even the ones that was with him. So sometimes we need correction. Sometimes correction does us good. We need correction. So he, he, said, he said, could you not watch for one hour? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. We need to pray. I know we use this scripture a lot at one of the churches I used to attend. And for one hour every day, we would pray in the spirit every day. And we use that scripture because the scripture says to watch and pray. So we would pray in the spirit one hour every day. And it, it, was, it was marvelous what God was doing in us. Now, in the next sentence says, God had to correct the disciples many times. He told Peter that Satan asked to sift him like wheat. But Peter said, I'm ready. 
But Jesus said, no, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So we, we think, sometimes we think we're a place where we're not. And this is Peter. Peter's the rock. Jesus just called him the rock because Jesus, Peter just said, I know who you are. You're the son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but you, you will be my rock. But now he's saying, you're going to deny me. Now he's saying, get behind me, Satan. So there's times when we even, even we, we have to reorient ourselves. Sometimes um, when I was in military, we had a compass. We had to go out, and we'd be in the, in the woods, and we'd have to stop and reorient ourselves to see where we were. The GPS system works that today. It's the same thing. You recalculating, recalculating, because we're going down this road and going down this road, and we're not going down the right road, and here comes the thing saying, recalculate, go this way and go that way, but sometimes we already know the route, so we're trying to get out there before him, but we don't realize that road is closed at this time, and GPS is trying to tell us, don't go down this road right now, because that road is closed. So we have to be able to take correction. We have to take the correction. Could you not watch? Could you not stay awake? Could you not? That we have to correct our children. We, we correct our children. Father corrects us because he loves us. He, can't, he don't want to leave us in a state of where we are, but where we are going. Number five, knowing God as a father who we should emulate, who we should copy. This is, what is, this is what is making our prayers, our prayer journey so powerful. This is what is making us so powerful. It says, therefore, gird up, 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, it says, therefore, gird up your loins, the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourself according to the form of lust in your ignorance, but as... But as he which hath called you who is holy, you also be holy in manner and conversation. Because it is written, be you holy, for I am holy. Now, being holy doesn't mean go and change your wardrobe or doing all this stuff. But it means to be like God, speak like God, think like God. You have to be around God to do that. I got a few minutes. I want to speak on this real quick. John 21, 15 through 17. John 21, 15 through 17. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, or he asked him again a second time, Some, Simon, son of Berzina, Jonah, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And then he said, follow me. Remember, Peter's the one, the same one that denied him three times. So God, Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? God is asking us tonight, JCCI. Do you love me? Do you love me? JCI is saying yes. He said, feed my lambs. Our vision is to see the gospel of Jesus, our jubilee, preached in every continent of the world that men may be reconciled back to their creator, liberated from their oppression of the devil, and prepared for the second coming of Christ. JCCI, do you love me? Feed my lambs. He asks us again. JCCI, do you love me? And we say, yes, Father. You know that we love you. Tend to my sheep. Our mandate, reset, renew, relaunch. The, God, the chapel of victory is placed in the community to give reset from the struggles, resources that you, that you need in life, restoration of what the devil has stolen from men and women, release from the affliction of the devil. Again, the third time, Jesus asked, JCCI, do you love me? And we say, yes, you know that we love you. He says... Feed my sheep, our mission, to raise an army of mature, rooted, and grounded believers, to infuse the vision into them and release them to other parts of the world to do the same, to pursue the vision via every available medium 
as the Lord leads and provides the means to minister to the needs of the people spiritually, materially, and financially, to, re to teach them how to use the word of God to improve the quality of their lives, mind, body, soul, and spirit. JCCI, do you love me? Then know the vision. Go and follow me. Do what I'm calling you to do. Do this. Pray when you speak. Pray not just about yourself. Pray over the community. Pray over those that are here. Pray over the ones that even tonight as the evangelist was praying, the ones that was on her heart to pray. God says, if you love me, do you love me? And if you do, feed my sheep. Tend to my sheep. Feed my flock. This is our mandate. This is our vision. You can find it right on the website. It's right on jccinc.org. It's, it's right there. It's right there. Our vision, our mandate. This is what we are called to do as this body, as, as we are attached to this body. Now, some people may be watching that's not attached to JCCI, but God is still telling you, if you love me, do what I called you to do. Know your purpose. Know your purpose because in this season, where we are, what we're doing, what is going on with, with COVID-19 and what God is doing throughout the lands through, through government and everything, God wants us to emulate him. He wants us to emulate him. One of the reasons I believe that people are struggling so much because the body of Christ is not emulating God. They're not emulating their father. The love is not there. The, 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 so many things are not right. Within, and I'm, I'm not to, here to judge the body. But Father is resetting us. He's setting us and saying, hear what I'm saying to you. Hear what I'm saying to you tonight. Know me in prayer. Know I want you to emulate me. Jesus emulated. He didn't do anything what he did not see the Father do. He didn't do anything. And when the disciples saw that, they said, teach us this. Where are we when, when we say, God, we love you. God, we want this. And God says, I want you to go call that person. I want you to love this person. I want you to pray for that one who despitefully uses you. I want you, even though we're in the middle of protest and things we might not like, God says, I want you to cover them. I want you to pray for them. I want you to live, God, I, 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 that's a tough one, God. That's a tough one because you, you, don't, you don't know what's going on with our lives. You don't know. God says, I paid the price for you. And if you will show others what I have shown you, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God. Now, we understand that there's times that, that God will do other things, but God is saying tonight, do you love me? Are you with me? As we're going into this journey into prayer, Knowing God as our Father. Do other people know that you know God as Father? Do people know that you know God as Father? When you're in the grocery store or even on a phone call, and maybe it's a solicitor, and you're ready to just chew them up one side and down another, do you know they're just doing their job? Maybe it's not the best job. Maybe that's the only job they could get. Maybe the only job they could get was tele, tele, uh, teleprompter, whatever they, whatever they had to do. But you can sit there and say, you know what, I don't need this, but I, I pray that God will minister to you. Emulate God. When we do this, I totally believe that this world will change because when they know the love of God, it's only by the love of God, only by the love of God that things will break, only by the love of God that things will change. Jesus, God heard our cries. He heard them time and time again in the Old Testament. He came and he brought them out of bondage. Time and time again, when they cried out, he would come and, and rescue them. And now he's given us Jesus. He's given us Jesus to be able to do this so that now there's no barrier between him and us. Now there's nothing that, that can separate us from the love of God, knowing God as Father. And as we know God as Father, and we go out and do the mission and the vision of JCCI, and we go out and we do this, and as we pray in for the lost, we pray in for the sick, we pray in for those, and we're saying, God, not your will be, not my will be done, but your will be done. Because sometimes we might not like the person he sends us to minister to, but God already knows that. But he says, I love that person. I love them, and I'm sending you to them. And it's so he can teach you something. You're believing God for something. He says, this is what I want you to do. Now go do it. 
I pray tonight that you hear what God has said to you. I pray tonight that you will do what God calls us to do. I pray, Father, I pray tonight that as people are stirring up in their spirits even tonight, I pray, Father, that, that they are knowing you as, Father, as we're in our journey into prayer, in this season of prayer. I pray, oh God, that tonight that every prayer will be answered. And I pray, oh God, that you are healing our land. I pray, oh God, that you're healing our hearts. I pray, oh God, that you are with us, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you, Father, tonight for ministering your word to us. We call all things done now in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen.